Now let's move on to the second part of um, this thing, which is the other features of entity relationship diagrams. This is part, uh, the presentation part two, the chapter is the same. So now let's add uh, new features which, will sh which are motivated by what some of the stuff we saw earlier. The first is a notion of a weak entity set. Um, so let's start with an example and come back to some of the other stuff there. I showed this notation where the diamond uh, relationship linking section and course was shown with a double diamond. Now what does this mean? Right? So um, the point here is that section has to be associated with a course. Right? So I have to have a relationship. But I also said that every entity must have a primary key. Now what is the primary key of the section? How is the section uniquely identified? One option is to create a fake ID. I can do that. I'll just create an integer ID. Each section has some unique ID. Then that's fine. Supposing I don't want to do that. I know that a section is associated with the course. And I don't want to create a fake ID. In, in our diagram, we actually didn't create a fake ID. So it's identified by a course that it is linked to. I could add course ID as an attribute here. In fact, in the relational model, course ID is an attribute of section. But if I put course ID here, then I'm duplicating stuff. I already have the course ID in the relationship between section and course ID. If I again add course IDs purely to get a primary key, I get a duplication. So I should not add course ID here, but instead, I'm going to say that the section is going to be identified by a combination of the identifying course here. So there is an identifying relationship for section, which is identified by the double diamond. But that's not enough. A particular course may have many sections. How do I uniquely identify which section it is? So you remember we used section ID, semester, and year. So instead of showing those as uh, underlines, I'm going to have a dashed underline. So this indicates that the primary key of section consists of the primary key of the other side of this identifying relationship, plus all these attributes shown with dashed underlines. Okay, And I don't put course ID here. So since this does not have a primary key, it's called a weak entity set. Its primary key can be inferred, but it's not shown as part of over here. It what is shown instead are the dash underlines, which are called the discriminator. It's not the primary key, it's a discriminator. Is this clear? So this is a way to get around this uh, issue. Hmm? Weak entity, yeah, so in the, yeah, that's a good point. In the earlier notation, we used a double box uh, uh, around it. Uh, here we didn't. Uh, we thought it's, uh, the fact that it is linked by a total relationship with an identifying relationship and it does not have a primary key. The two together should make it clear that it is a weak entity. Uh, so we could have added it, um, could have. Uh, part of the reason we didn't add it is that, uh, you know, the standard UML tools don't have a way to draw a double box. But yeah, we could have done it. For that matter, they don't have a way to draw a double diamond. We, we could have done it. We could, we could have done it, uh, we didn't, that's all. Okay, so coming back to notation, we have a notion of a weak entity set. We have a notion of an identifying entity set for the weak entity set. In fact, you can have more complex situations where you have multiple uh, identifying entity sets for a single weak entity set. Um, so then you'll have multiple identifying relationships which together uniquely identify it. And then the uh, identifying relationship which is depicted with a double diamond and a discriminator also called a partial key which is part of the primary key. And the actual primary key is formed by the primary key of the strong entity set or the identifying entity set on which the weak entity set is. It's called existence dependent. Now this brings up another issue. In addition to this uh, notational issue of should it have a primary key or not, there is another deeper issue which says that a section cannot exist without an corresponding course. 
Okay, so there is a deeper thing which is an existence dependency. This entity is existence dependent upon this other entity. It cannot exist by itself. It makes no sense for a section to exist by itself without a course. So modeling it as a weak entity with an identifying relationship to another entity set makes this clear that there is an existence dependency. So what is the impact of the existence dependency? We will have A, a foreign key dependence. And B, if you want to allow it to be deleted, the course should be deleted, you have to delete the section also. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. So if you want to allow courses to be deleted, you would have an on-delete cascade. You could create that automatically. But more likely, you will not allow courses to be deleted and cause cascading delete of section. OK. A strong entity set is one which is not weak. Uh, although in this slide, I'm saying that the weak entity set is identified by some other strong entity sets. It's even possible to have a cascade. You can have one weak entity set which is identified by a strong entity set, and then another one further nested within it which is identified by this one, and indirectly by that one also. So you can have a chain of these things. I don't have slides on it, but it's possible. Okay, so now let's, uh, with the notations we have seen so far, let's look at the university uh, enterprise. So you, there are many things in here. Let's find some of them. Student entity is there. Instructor entity is there. Department entity. Se uh, section, which is a weak entity. Course, which is an entity. Classroom, which is an entity. Uh, time slot, which is an entity. And then a whole bunch of relationships. Now, if you see here, instructor is related to a department. Note that we did not put department name in instructor here. In the relational schema, we did put the department name as an attribute, but here we don't. Similarly, uh, students are linked to departments by student department, and students to instructors by advisor. We have seen these. Now, let's come to course and section. Course is, of course, an entity. It has a course ID, title, credits as before, but it does not have a department because there is a relationship course department. Note a few constraints here. Instructor to department is double line. It's total. The instructor must be in a department. Correspondingly, in the relational schema, we should put not null. To say that the instructor should not. So there are two parts. Because an instructor can have only one department, we could put department name as an attribute of instructor. Otherwise, we cannot. Second, because of the total participation here, instructor must have a department. Therefore, we can say not null. So this is where constraints in the ER diagram are reflected in SQL constraints, which ensure that the database uh, does not violate some uh, basic properties. Is this clear? OK, now let's come to uh, the other thing, which is courses have sections. And this is a weak entity. And note that uh, because there's a double line here, total participation with an identifying relationship, we know that section is identified by course. And its primary key, when we convert it to relations, will be course ID, section ID, semester year. Note that. In our uh, relational model, we actually stored the building and rule number with a section. But when we do the ER modeling, we are not jumping to that yet. We, are, we have a classroom, a section, and associate a classroom, a section to a classroom by section class. Okay. Now, we are assuming that a section, so in general, a section might meet in different classrooms on different days, maybe. But here we have made the restriction that a uh, section should have only one classroom. It should not keep changing. If it change, we have to do more. Okay, which day is it in which classroom? We are not modeling all that here. So we are insisting that a section should, be a, have, should have a classroom and only one classroom. So total and arrow. Now again, this property that a section has definitely has a classroom and only one 
let us, later on when we convert to a relational model, it let us store it as an attribute in section. Otherwise, we would have a separate relation, section classroom, which keeps track of which classrooms are associated with which section. So, take, uh, teachers and takes, for example, are not many to one. Therefore, they are many to many. Therefore, we had to keep them as separate relations. Teachers is a relation, takes is a relation. And grade, we made an attribute of takes. And uh, so that became an attribute of the takes relation. And prereq is a relationship between course and course with role labels here, course ID and prereq ID. So the role uh, indicators are here. And finally, I want to point this part out. Time slot in our relational model was actually a bit funny, uh, which causes some complication. Uh, but when we do the ER model, we want to model time slot as an entity. Now, this is a choice we made. We didn't have to model it as an entity, but it might be useful to do so. We chose to do so here. Again, there is no one true answer in uh, the context of ER modeling. There are many, many possible reasonably correct ER models for a particular enterprise. Which you choose is a matter of uh, the things which you want to model and your taste, both of these. Uh, section two, classroom. Because uh, this is not shown as a double diamond. Identifying relationships are shown as double diamond. No, no, just because a classroom is a strong entity, section is a weak entity, doesn't mean it identifies section. So, if you think about it, uh, you know, sec a section is not conceptually part of a classroom. It has an independent existence, right? In fact, the total relationship here um, might be questionable. Maybe when I first uh, create data, I may actually create sections without an associated classroom. That's how it works, actually. Therefore, I probably don't want to put the total there. Okay? But anyway, in this case, I have done that. Um, so, uh, if you think of it at a conceptual level, section is not existence dependent on classroom. It is existence dependent on course. And that's why we made the section course be an identifying relationship. So, coming back here, I chose time slot to be an entity, entity set. It has a time slot ID. And now, it has a multi-valued attribute, which is day, start time, and end time. And I, I'm not actually noting here that uh, day and start time is a key for this set. Okay, it's not part of our notation. So there's a limit to how many kind of constraints we put in. Not everything can be modeled using the built-in constraint. This actually is true in UML also. UML in general has a notion of constraints, which it provides by itself. It also has the ability to put in any text you want there, additional constraints which are um, not part of the standard, but these are things which you can annotate it with. So maybe we could annotate here, saying that day and start time uniquely identify a member of this set. Okay. So you could add on your own textual annotations to an entity relationship diagram. Now there are two other topics uh, which are covered here. Reduction to relational schemas and um, extra features. The reduction to relational schemas, I think I have been telling you on the fly as we did it. Uh, so given that we have about 10 minutes left, I'll just quickly uh, touch on just one or two topics. First of all, every strong entity set will become a relation of its own. Every weak entity set would become a relationship of its own. Relationships may become relations of their own or may get folded into ex in entity sets. So here, section became an entity set. What were its, uh, section became a relation rather. What were its attributes? You have to copy over the primary key from the identifying course. So course ID, section ID, semester year. What are the other attributes? That depends on what relationships we fold into section. We'll come to that in a moment. For the moment, the section relationship has course ID, section ID, semester year. 
the course relation as course ID title credits for the moment. Uh, moving on, uh, there's an instructor relation, student relation with just these attributes for now. Advisor, should it become a relation or should it become an attribute of student? That's a choice. Okay. We chose to make advisor a relation to potentially give us the flexibility of having a student with multiple advisors. So first of all, if this is many to many, there is no choice. Advisor has to be a relation. But because it is um, many to one, we actually have the option of storing an instructor ID along with student. Now note that it's not total, which means the student may not have an advisor. You can model that by having a null value for that um, advisor. So what does it mean? If we keep advisor as an attribute of the student relation, it has to be a foreign key, referencing instructor. However, it is nullable because the student may not have an advisor. So this is why SQL allows foreign keys which are nullable. But if it's total, a student must have an advisor, you could say not null, forcing it to have a specific advisor, not a null value. Is this clear? Yeah. yeah. So supposing advisor had an attribute last meeting time, and I decided to uh, fold advisor into student, then the attribute last meeting time will also get folded into student. Now, um, sometimes you can have uh, redundancy here. Um, so for example, um, here. Uh, so if I created a relation institute department, okay, uh, then it's actually easier to, you, you could create a separate uh, relation, instructor department, which has ID and department name, but it's easier to fold it in here. So when I say redundancy of schemas, I'm saying that I could create the relation, but instead I choose to fold it in. The title may not be a very clear one. So I think we have seen all this. There are a few issues with uh, composite and multi-valued attributes. Composite attributes are actually easy. I can uh, just create a name. For example, a name, first name. I could make it as name underscore first underscore name. Name underscore middle underscore initial or something. So to make it unique. So it's flat in the relational model. Um, what about phone number? It's a multi-valued attribute. The standard relational model or relational database do not have multi-valued attributes. Actually, many do support it today. I could use it if I wish. But if I don't want to do that, then what do I do? How do I store phone number? I have to create a separate relation, phone number. What would its attributes be? The primary key of the entity, ID. And the second one would be phone number itself. So every multi-valued attribute would turn into a separate relation. OK, so that's uh, shown here. So instructor phone with ID and phone number. So I'll skip some of the details. These are obvious. Uh, now this brings us to why we did some weird stuff with uh, the time slot ID. So we had section to time slot mapping. Okay, now each section has at most one time slot. And um, time slot had a day start time, end time. Okay, so what did we do here? Um, I folded time slot ID into section. I didn't keep a separate relationship section time slot. I folded it into section. Now for this part, time slot, I could have, normally I would create two relations. One is a time slot relation, and then a second one is a time slot timings or something like that relation, which has this part. Now what does the time slot relation contain now? What attribute would the time slot relation have? Time slot ID. That's all, nothing else. Okay, so I could have done that. I could have kept that relation. And then in section, time slot ID would be a foreign key referencing time slot. Okay, I could have done that. 
And then there's a, a time slot relation with only time slot ID, nothing else. And a third relation, time slot details, which has time slot ID, day, start time, end time. Uh, time slot ID, day, start time, end time. What is the key for this? Because I know that I have this extra information that end time is unique given these three. This becomes the primary key of this relation. Now I chose, when I did the relational schema, I chose to merge these two tables. Time slot and time slot details I merged in. What is the implication of this? Basically those two tables, one had just time slot ID, nothing else. The other had the details. I merged it into one table. Um, so that's the schema you saw in the end. But there is one catch. In the merge table, is time slot ID a primary key? It's not. In this table, the primary key is time slot ID, day, start time. In section now, I have a time slot ID which is an attribute. Can it be a foreign key? Let me repeat the question. In section, I put time slot ID as an attribute. On this side, I merge those two tables into one. Can time slot ID be a foreign key into this relation? The answer is what? Yes or no? No. Why? Because? Hmm? Yeah. The three attributes together form a primary key. Time slot by itself is not a primary key. It's not even unique. So it cannot be a foreign key. SQL does not support a foreign key into something which is not unique. So I cannot declare it as a foreign key. So this is something which I have lost. That's a trade-off. We chose this. Um, so the flip side is, because it's not a foreign key, I can put in any value I want in time slot ID. I can have a section with time slot 59 and no information about 59 in terms of the meeting time. So there is a potential for inconsistency because I merged these two tables. Okay. So that's the quick summary of ER2 relational conversion. And the last part is extended ER features. Um, I'll just do it by example. Uh, the first uh, of these extended concept is specialization. This is actually a very, very useful feature. I have, uh, between instructor and student, we had several common attributes. We had ID, we had name, maybe we would have many more like this. Now, the, both instructors and students might be allowed to borrow library books. Okay, so as far as the library is concerned, I may have to keep, if I want to keep track of this separately, uh, student, instructor, library database has to have two separate tables. It actually makes sense for the library to have a single table, a single conceptual thing, the library, which is a library user, which could be any person. Any person is a library user. So by modeling a person, which has the common attributes here, student as a as a specialization of person. Employee is a specialization of person and has salary. Employee again can be specialized in instructor and secretary. Instructor may have a rank, secretary may have something else. This is fake, okay, don't pay any attention to the meaning of the attribute. You can create a specialization hierarchy. So this is very useful in ER modeling. We didn't do it in our university ER, but we could have. We could have combined student and instructor into a person, which we have done here. Uh, there are also issues in constraints on this uh, specialization, should it, uh, so for example here, if this specialization is disjoint, that means a person can be an employee or a student, but not both. If it is overlapping, an employee can be, a person can be an employee and a student. Okay, so that's a constraint, disjoint versus overlapping. Um, there are many more constraints, I'm not going to tell you complete uh, everything, but completeness, which is a uh, constraint, which is, should a higher level entity set, must it, must it necessarily belong to a lower level, or is that optional? Could you have a person who is not an instructor or a student? If so, it's a partial. If it is total, if the completeness constraint is Partial is optional, which total every person must be 
an instructor or a student, or both, depending on the previous constraint. And now, depending on the choices, uh, the, the constraints that you put in there, you have multiple uh, choices for the uh, relational schema. So one relational schema is this. I have a person. Let's just look at person, student, employee, not the lower levels. I have person with ID, name, street, city, student with ID, total credits, but not name, street, city. I'm not repeating that information. So a student is represented twice, once in the student table, once in the person table. Similarly, an employee is represented twice, once in the employee table, once in the person table. There's no duplication. Another option, uh, but of course the drawback of this is if I want all the information of a student, you have to join with person and student. Another option is to copy all the attributes down. Person has ID, name, street, city. Student has ID, name, street, city, total credits. Employee has ID, name, street, city, salary. What is the difference between these two options? One is the efficiency. But this one can be redundant under what condition? Uh, if it is total, uh, yeah, so if it is total, you could uh, put nothing in the person table and have only student and employee. That could be an option. Um, yeah, but then if you have a, some relationship to person, you can't represent that. Okay. But if it's partial, again, some of these issues crop up again. Um, there's another issue also. So that's one, total versus partial. The other is disjoint versus overlapping. Supposing it's overlapping. A person can be a student and an employee. Then all this information is repeated for the same ID. It's there in student and in employee. Name, street, city are written and it's stored twice. So it may be stored twice in person and student, or twice in student and employee, or maybe thrice in all three. So this thing has a danger of redundancy. So you would do it if um, we are, don't care about person anymore. There are no relationships directly with person. So we don't have to store the person table. It's total. Nobody is just a person. And it is disjoint. Nobody can be a student and an employee. Then you can do this. Otherwise, you should go for the previous one. Is, is this clear? So the conversion depends on all these constraints. Uh, we don't have time for this. And I just want to wrap up. The, so there are other slides on comparison of this notation, uh, summary of notations, and comparison with other earlier notations, the Chen and the ID1FX notations. So it's there in the book as well as in the slides. The stuff on UML, again, I'm going to skip that. This is just comparing our ER notation with UML. It looks visually close, but there are some uh, differences. And we'll stop. There are a few more concepts. Um, there's something called aggregation. I don't have time for it now. <laughs>